Welcome to the AWS Research IT Training Series, which offers free training engagement geared towards research IT professionals. I'm Marcy Collinson, your session correspondent and the Senior Scientific Research Programs Manager for the AWS Research Team. Today, we are delighted to have Dr. Jin Jin Su, Senior Solutions Architect at AWS, presenting on Serverless Jupyter on AWS, Fully Managed Notebook Environments. Jinjin was an astrophysicist and a senior software executive in higher education before he joined AWS as a senior solutions architect, working with several large US universities and colleges. He specializes in software development, big data, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and high performance computing. We will reserve the last five to 10 minutes of the session for a Q&A portion, but please feel free to place any questions that you may have during the presentation in the questions queue in the GoToWebinar toolbar, and we will read them aloud later on. So without further ado, I'll pass the microphone over to Jinjun. Jinjun, please take it away. Thank you, Marcy. Um, I also have my one of my colleagues, um, my fellow SA, uh, Chris King, on the call as well. Um, if you have any questions and then you put in that, I believe we have a question session and he will answer some of this uh, clarify, clarifying questions. And at the end, I will leave five minutes to answer some um, questions in more depth. Um, so again, my name is Jin Jun Xu. I work with uh, several large uh, higher education institutions uh, on the East Coast. One of my favorite uh, activity is to uh, talk to uh, educators like you. Uh, to first of all to understand what kind of workload you're doing with compute and it's and also try my best to explain um to off explain the new offers or services um i, I really love technology um try to introduce those uh, technology and services to you and then my proudest moment will be seeing some researchers using those technology and in their in their research uh, so today's session is one of, um, I believe it's the second in the series. Uh, we understand that um, there are so many different services and uh, functions in AWS, especially in cloud computing. Um, there are over around 300 services and uh, 3,000, over 3,000 different features on AWS. It's really overwhelming to get, uh, to get started on cloud computing. So what one of our goals in this series is to pick some specific topics so you can use immediately uh, in your research or in your work to help the research community. So today our topic is serverless Jupyter um, AWS. It's a fully managed notebook environments that uh, I'll go through some of the examples. So hopefully at the end you will have a good idea of what uh, what kind of services we talked about and how to interact with those services through Jupyter Notebook. So because of the uh, diversity of the um, of the audience, I will give a brief introduction to uh, what Jupyter Notebook is and then uh, what it means by serverless. And then I will introduce you to four services that um, are tightly integrated with um, Jupyter Notebook. At the end, I'll leave some time for demo and questions. So first of all, Jupyter Notebook. Um, Jupyter Notebook is an open source project that came out of the uh, IPython project. Um, IPython project is a, a group of developers trying to develop interactive computing capacity capabilities for developers. And then they find out that one of the components that develop uh, Jupyter Notebook is uh, much more useful um, in a lot of different areas. So they branched that project out and around 2014 and created a uh, project Jupyter. Uh, AWS is a really active uh, member of the Jupyter community. Uh, we have uh, members on the steering committee, and we are also one of the institutional partners for Project Jupyter. Um, what it is, it's basically, you can consider that to be a web application. It provides a in-browser interface. And it's cell-based. Cell-based meaning um, we break the notebook up into cells, and each cell has its own execution. Um, it's a mixed environment of a markdown language, uh, which is perfect for you to do documentation. And then uh, the code block, where you can um, write your code in different languages. Um, in this session, we mostly use Python as an example uh, in our examples. So in different cells, when you 
make a change to a line of code, and then you ex you can execute that sale. Whatever the variables or function you define in the previous uh, sales uh, still remain uh, active. That means you don't have to run the entire program over again. So that's one of the benefits of the Jupyter Notebook. And uh, <clears throat> the typical use cases, um, you can do a, a lot of people uh, do data analytics and visualization. There are packages in Jupyter Notebook that you can use to help you um, display charts and do data analytics, data processing, and then display the result there. It's really visual, really interactive. And then you can, a uh, quick experiment and hands-on learning is one of my favorite uh, things to do in Jupyter Notebook. Uh, if I'm learning something new and I want to try out the code and follow the instruction, and also want to save some notes for me, for myself, or someone else later on to follow. I can uh, create a Jupyter Notebook and I write the how-tos or step, how to repeat this process and execute uh, code right, right there. I will show you some examples uh, later on. It can be also used uh, to write technical instructions. Um, instead of just very boring text, uh, how to do this, one, two, three, and then you can embed code into your technical documentation. Um, recently, uh, the Jupyter Notebook has become the development, development environment for machine learning. So uh, our SageMaker uh, framework, within that SageMaker, uh, SageMaker Notebook, you can build, train, and deploy your machine learning algorithms and models uh, and also, uh, in one clip uh, in a, or with uh, several lines of code. And I have seen our customers use uh, Jupyter Notebook for homework assignment as well, right? You have a question and then you have a block of code or template that you want your student to follow. You can embed the code within the instructions, coding, of course. And the research sharing is another thing I see a lot of my customers uh, doing. The um, having theory, have equations, and then have a proof of concept uh, step to repeat a certain experiment. Um, they create a notebook, send it to someone else. Uh, someone else will use uh, their own, put in their own Jupyter notebook environment, and they can see the result of the research, or even the steps of the research they can they can follow. Uh, there's virtually unlimited uh, possibility for you to use Jupyter Notebook. Uh, I'll show you some other examples of how we can front end uh, Jupyter Notebook to, Notebook to other services. Uh, this is the example I was talking about. Uh, for hands-on learning. So I was learning how to use vectorization or parallelization um, with, an, with a number. So there are three different ways of calculating uh, the power, um, power off function. Uh, one with the serial, uh, just loop through the elements. Um, the other one is used to vectorize with the target of a CPU, and another one is parallel. Parallel. So I wanted to look at how performance varies. So I write up this uh, really simple Jupyter notebook with the instructions uh, based on this documentation. And then I just execute the code. You'll see the result that, uh, hey, um, the vectorized parallel um, time is great, greatly reduced to only 1.9 seconds versus 88 seconds with the serialized. So this is something that uh, I use a lot in my, uh, in my work. So the basics of Jupyter Notebook, when you first uh, start with Jupyter Notebook, uh, you'll see a dashboard that has a file browser and it has um, every time you execute um, a piece of code or a notebook, you will uh, create a new kernel, a running kernel. And then there are other options of even with IPython parallel, you can run the notebook on an array of uh, computes or nodes. Um, to, uh, parallel computing. A notebook document is basically a mix of uh, instructions and code. And then within the Jupyter Notebook, there are some concepts. Uh, there's a key concept called environment. So environment is basically a kernel, which is the compute engine. You're running a Python, or you, or you can run R or Julia, uh, and some other language. There are uh, hundreds of, uh, uh, not, even, not hundreds, but there are lots of different uh, kernels that support different languages. Uh, people have created. Um, then on top of that kernel, you can install different frameworks. For example, for our machine learning, you can install MXNet, you can TensorFlow, PyTorch, or, Tensor, um, 
or uh, chainer for uh, deep learning. So after you create a kernel, you install packages that becomes your compute environment. So now let's move to the uh, serverless. So the, uh, the evolution of compute has been starting from physical machines to virtual machines, VMs, uh, we, we talk about. Uh, and then now gradually everything is moving to the container. So you can consider that to be a whole spectrum of compute. There's on the one end is the physical servers. The, on the other end is containers. Uh, what is serverless? A serverless, with serverless, you don't have to worry the worry about the infrastructure, the the physical machines you're running, or even the virtual machine. Uh, what kind of hypervisor you're using, or what kind of framework or software you're using to virtualize those machines? Um, they mostly run on containers nowadays, and you don't need to worry about their uh, networking. You don't have to worry about the port. You don't have to worry about all those. Right? So you are just running your application. In some in some containers, and then um, as you let's say if you're machine learning that requires a lot of CPUs to process or to to um, build that model, um, the underlying infrastructure will auto scale, um, will scale automatically, and then the, you only pay for what you use. That means uh, when you are not using it. Um, I'll show you an example in our SageMaker notebook is that how those containers are being used. Um, basically, your line of code says, I want to create a model, and then I want to train a model. So you will be using some um, services or resources, computer resources in the back end. And then you'll start paying for those resources when your model start training. Once your model stop training, finish training, and then that container will go away. You will not be paying for that. So that's really different from what you're doing on on-prem environment, that you have to have a hardware there 24-7. And it's a really highly available. Um, let's say in our on-prem, you do uh, computing, and if something happens to the hardware, it's gone. Right? So unless you have very highly available uh, or redundancy built in to your on-prem environment, uh, you're going to have to catch up and um, maybe restore from backup, stuff like those. In the cloud, when you're running on a serverless framework, um, those are highly high availability is taken care of. We take care of the infrastructure when a container or the underlying hardware uh, fails. The container is going to start running on another hardware. Now you don't have to, you don't even uh, notice the difference. So those are the benefits of the serverless. Uh, so to further explain that, um, I want to borrow the one of the concepts we used in AWS when we talk about security. It's called shared responsibility model. So AWS is responsible for the security of the cloud. That includes the compute, storage, database, and networking. And of course, the underlying infrastructure, there, the network, uh, the global infrastructure that those services run on top of. And uh, as the end user, our customers are responsible for what type of application they use. And when they build up a virtual private cloud, they're responsible for the firewalls and the monitoring and access ID, identity and access management. And then on top of that, their application itself. So in serverless, we, uh, we call it a shifted responsibility model. Um, we're responsible for a lot more stuff. Um, than you want to, right? So you don't, the heavy lifting, that's uh, you talk to AWS uh, people, you'll probably hear this heavy lifting uh, all the time is heavy lifting is building an infrastructure, keep the infrastructure, infrastructure secure and build the basic foundational services, compute storage, and then on top of that, virtualizations and container services. Um, those are the things that you don't have to worry about anymore. Those responsibilities are shared from our customers or from you <clears throat> to AWS. You're, so you can focus on the work you need to do. So as you move from the um, one end of the, the compute spectrum um, to the other end, uh, you're basically shifting, shifting more responsibility from you to AWS to service providers. Now let's uh, look at 
some managed Jupyter environments on AWS. So there are two takeaways from today. If you, uh, if there's two things you remember from today's session, this is one of those. Um, there's another one I'll introduce later, but um, for today, the, you can consider Jupyter Notebooks on AWS, those managed Jupyter environments to be the front end to many AWS compute services. Um, here, I will uh, introduce you to two, uh, to four of those. The first one is for big data analysis. Um, so Amazon EMR Notebooks. When you start up a EMR Notebook, you get access to the underlying EMR cluster. Um, so when you're dealing with big data, uh, let's say you have uh, lots of data, right? Well, we don't have a really strict definition of how big is the big data, but let's say you have uh, hundreds of millions of rows in a data warehouse that you need to do some join and do some calculation. Um, running on a single server is probably gonna take you for a long time with a large amount of RAM. It's kind of like uh, drinking water from uh, from a cup with a single straw. Um, the straw has a certain size. The hardware underneath your um, the machine can have a certain amount of IOs or throughput. Uh, in order to process a large amount of data really quickly, so you need to have a whole bunch of straws, like a bundle of straws, and that's how uh, what the Hadoop cluster really is is a basically a cluster of machines that uh, chain together, put together um, with their uh, the hard disks. So when you are reading a block of data, it, you're not just reading from one hard disk, you're reading from a real hard disk. On top of that, um, the compute is sitting on top of that uh, shared file disk system. The, uh, the, the array of storage is called uh, HDFS, uh, Hadoop Distributed File System. On top of that, you run Apache Spark. So that's what uh, Amazon EMR is. It's based on uh, Apache Hadoop. It's for big data processing and uh, analytics. Uh, through this Apache Spark, you can run queries that you don't have to worry about how to <clears throat> get data from different disks. The Apache Spark will take care of that. So the way to interact with Apache Spark is through this Jupyter Notebook. Um, so through the Spark magic kernel, um, via the Apache Levy API endpoint, you in your notebook, you will be um, accessing a Hadoop cluster. Um, the way to run, to, you get access to that uh, Jupyter notebook is through serverless. Uh, you don't have to worry about what server that notebook runs on. And there is uh, gonna be an example of, or a live demo for that as well, uh, later on. So with the EMR uh, notebook, right, so there is a separation of compute from storage or from your notebook itself. Um, let's say when you are developing your big data processing, you start with a small, smaller data set and then try to work out your, uh, your program. Uh, in, when you are working on that, you don't need a really large cluster. You just need a, maybe a cluster with two nodes. And so you, uh, you can make sure that your HDFS uh, or uh, your Spark C SQL works. So you set up your network and it attached to a Yammer cluster, which is a smaller size. And later on, your program works great. You want to put into um, production. <clears throat> At that moment, you create a larger, much larger, or even really, really large Yammer cluster and attach that notebook to that cluster. Your program remains, remains the same. Uh, your uh, processing will just run a lot faster. Uh, we have customers that uh, <clears throat> Uh, during COVID, um, I worked with a customer to process um, month worth of nationwide uh, mobility data um, on their um, on their on-prem uh, EMR cluster, or not EMR, the Hadoop clusters. Um, one state for one day takes 17 hours to process. Um, after they move to AWS EMR, uh, that process uh, the processing time went down to 10 minutes or one day on a cluster that has 40 nodes um, that can process the, um, their, the data set in 10 minutes. Um, so when you are detaching or reattaching um, your notebook to and from, uh, cluster, from different clusters, your notebooks are saved to S3, our storage, our object storage. That is independent of the EMR cluster. Um, so 
clusters if, uh, can be really expensive, especially when they're very large. So you don't need to have the cluster running all the time. Consider a cluster to be ephemeral. That means when you need it, create it. Uh, when you don't need that, you can shut it down or turn it off. But your notebook are still there. It's still going to be connected. It's uh, still going to be available. Next time when you need to do the data processing again, create a cluster, reattach that notebook. So that's the persistency. A very easy access. You don't need to remote access or SSH into the head node of the notebook or run command lines to do your data processing. You have a very, very nice interface to your notebook to run your program. There is an example um, of that EMR cluster where we were talking about. So this is the data example data set uh, about uh, 100 million rows. Um, I wanted to uh, load the data up. Uh, do some joins and then do some calculation, sum it up. So this is basically a map reduce process, right? You load it up, you compute. And within this notebook, I create this Spark uh, context first. I execute this query. Um, you can also monitor this uh, the Spark jobs pro progress as, it's, as it calculates. I'll show you in the demo later on. <clears throat> So this is how you monitor the Spark process. So that's for the big data processing. So before you do uh, machine learning or you, before you do data analytics, right, you're gonna spend a lot of time doing data wrangling, um, getting data from different sources, clean it up, um, it, do some imputation, for example, and join some data, get rid of uh, some of the columns that you think might not be necessary. Uh, do some feature engineering. Right? So that whole process requires uh, ETLs. Um, for those who are not familiar with the ETL, it's a process of extract and then transform the data and load it into an environment that you can use later on. So for um, on AWS, we have AWS Glue services that help you to do the ETL. Within the Glue, um, there's a notebook. Jupyter notebook that you can use. So you can interactively develop your and testing your ETL. Once your uh, ETL process is done, um, it's a, it's really similar to software development. Right? You write a code, uh, you test the data source, and then you look at the result. If they're good, you put them into production. Same thing with the ETL. Um, once you develop and tested your ETL in a notebook, you can turn that notebook into part of a job or create a whole workflow. So that uh, those are the two data analytics uh, Jupyter Notebook uh, inter interfaces or front end. So let's uh, talk about quantum computing. So Amazon uh, Bracket uh, was just released uh, last month. It's the quantum computing service of AWS. Um, now you can explore the current state of the technology and learning how to program quantum computing and discover the potential use case um, very easily. Um, unless you're affiliated with a large research institution that has uh, quantum computing, now you're not gonna be able to play with it or uh, even learn how things work or uh, put your idea into, into practice um, before before the Amazon um, bracket was released, right? So with the release of the Amazon bracket, you can have access to uh, three different kinds of quantum computing environments, um, uh, the two different types. Uh, one is the quantum annealer from the D-Wave and the gate-based quantum computers that use uh, the trapped ions from IronQ and the uh, superconducting qubits from the Rigetti. So, With the Amazon Bracket and, uh, and the Jupyter Notebook that come with that, uh, Jupyter Notebook is the interface for you to access the Amazon Bracket. With that, you have a single environment to design, test, and, your, and run your quantum algorithms. And also, you got access to different kinds of uh, hardwares. Um, And you can use the notebook to experiment and build your uh, hybrid quantum um, and classical algorithms all in one single environment. There's a list of all the environments that you can use. 
uh, three different kinds of quantum computers and also one. So before you put your uh, program or algorithms to test on real hardware, you can start uh, you can start using a simulator to do that. Um, I'll show you uh, how to do that in the demo. Yeah, of course, the uh, the quantum technology right now is not ready for um, for production, but a lot of institutions or researchers realize that it's it could potentially be a technology that um, be really useful for solving problems that's not possible in the classical computing sense. So uh, people start thinking about how to build build up their expertise, how to learn those uh, with the uh, Amazon bracket. Um, you get an environment that you can start that process, start learning the quantum computing. You can build, test, and run all from the notebook. So this is one of the examples comparing the difference between the quantum computing, one of the um, uh, quantum manipulator, the difference between the quantum computing and uh, how we do um, how we do deep learning uh, through a neural network. There's actually a lot of uh, similarities. And then with the notebook, um, if you are doing development, you can use a local simulator. Once your code runs and your algorithm is providing you with the expected result, you can switch that to a real device uh, by just changing the device to from a simulator to a real, a real device. So let's spend some time talking about the fourth uh, services that use a lot of the Jupyter Notebook is the Amazon SageMaker Notebook. Now, Sage, our um, Jupyter uh, Notebook is the way of you do machine learning on AWS. So one of the um, efforts we are we have put in a lot into in the past few years was try to put the machine learning into the hands of the average developer. Instead of um, limit that capability for data scientists only. We are building um, services and we're building frameworks, services, and tools to enable uh, developers to do machine learning. So SageMaker is the result of that. With the SageMaker, we make it easy if, um, to do machine learning. A couple lines of code, you get um, the SageMaker has 17 building algorithms. Um, pretty much anything that you can think about, um, linear regression, logistic regressions, uh, deep learning, CNNs, RNNs, all this. Uh, we have building algorithms that uh, you can, that developers can use a very simple few line of the code and then build, their, build your model, train the data, and then deploy it all in one environment. And scalable, like I said, the, the training itself is going to be done serverlessly uh, based on what you need. You can specify different size of the compute to do your training. So the performance is really scalable, uh, cost effective. Uh, when you're using it, you only pay for what you use. And it's really secure. The underlying infrastructure are handled by AWS through that shared responsibility model. And then <clears throat> Once your model is trained, deployment is extremely easy. Um, think about uh, without a serverless uh, environment or fully managed uh, machine learning platform, uh, you will have to create your own cluster or create a, your own web server and put your models and serve it to, um, to your customers. You have to manage all those infrastructures. And now with uh, SageMaker, uh, it's a one-click uh, deployment of your model and then you're done. So this is the whole stack of our machine learning uh, services on AWS. Um, on the really bottom, if you are a data scientist and you need to build your own model to solve your own specific problems, you can use those um, machine learning frameworks we provide, TensorFlows, MXNet, PyTorch, uh, through the Gluon, Keras, those packages or APIs. Uh, you can build your deep learning um, and then you put on the container you can serve um, you can do your machine learning that way but if you're a developer you're not really you don't need those uh, build your own model you can use um, machine learning services like SageMaker notebook 
and SageMaker Studio. So those are two different flavors of, of the Jupyter Notebook. One is the notebook instance, one is the enhanced Jupyter Lab environment. I'll show you the interface later on. But um, you can use the building algorithm to start building a model really quickly and then deploy them with one click. And then on top of the ML services, we provide a lot of high level AI services as well. If you have vision and speech text uh, workloads, um, then you can use, without even writing any code or using Jupyter Notebook, you can use our AI services um, to get results really quickly. But the middle layer is where you are gonna use the Jupyter Notebook to interface with our uh, SageMaker services. Here's an example. Um, <clears throat> that example, this is the list of all the kernels we provide for the Jupyter Notebook. You can see that um, you can get access to MXNet, um, PyTorch, TensorFlow, those different, you can even do PySpark um, as well. Um, some people run R in Jupyter Notebook on SageMaker uh, Notebook environment. Uh, it's fully managed. There's an example of some code. Um, it's uh, XGPost, so it's a very, uh, very popular uh, linear regression or classification algorithm. You can use that to do both. Um, you get a SageMaker session first, and then you put a uh, point where your training data and validation data are, and then you create a container. This is where you get this building algorithm. So this XGPost uh, in the single code is the name of the building algorithm. Um, when you do that, uh, we give you a container image. Uh, what do you do with that container image? You use that container image to build an estimator, which is uh, basically your model. You set the hyperparameters of that XGBoost, and then you just call it dot .fit. This is where you start doing your training. So this container will come to life and then take your data, uh, the training or validation data, and build a model and get the result. And then if your model converges, hopefully, right, then you, your model is successful, then you can call this xgb.deploy XGB to create an endpoint for inference. So what is the endpoint for inference? You build a model, you have a whole large amount of training data. You build the model, you tune the parameter, the uh, model parameter, then you get that model. Then somebody else wants to use your model. Uh, you are either your web application or another researcher wants to use the model to do some prediction. So you need to have a way for people to get access, right? That deployment, yeah, we call inferencing uh, endpoint is where people uh, use your model. So um, in a lot of cases that uh, when you deploy that model yourself, you gotta have a lot of heavy lifting to do that. Uh, with the serverless SageMaker, it's really, really easy. Uh, yeah, don't worry if you don't understand what <laughs> this diagram is about, but uh, just consider this is your environment you run your notebook about. Once you start that, um, call in that container uh, and then deploy that container, this is what it happens. Um, all the things are gonna run in the environment. It's fully managed by AWS. Uh, you don't even need to see, you don't see it, and you don't need to know what's happening. There are a lot of things happening. You just get the result from your Jupyter Notebook as interface. So this is how serverless is done in SageMaker. <clears throat> so takeaway number two. So takeaway number one is Jupyter Notebook is the interface to a lot of our AWS services. Uh, well, I just listed four, right? Um, there are unlimited amount of possibilities that you can do with Jupyter Notebook. But, um, the takeaway number two is the SageMaker example that um, I will point it out when we when we go through that demo of where it is. So it's the best way to learn, start learning and practice in machine learning. There's hundreds and hundreds of uh, Jupyter Notebook. You can just copy and then start playing with it. A lot of the notebooks come with their sample data set as well. You just walk through those different steps and then you can learn. Uh, the building algorithms, and then you can create your own um, algorithm, and then you have, or bring your own data with this very limited amount of change that uh, you can start doing building your model immediately. So this is a really important. Um, this takeaway number two, right? So, uh, 
I hope hopefully that uh, after the session you will all go to, uh, go play with uh, the SageMaker and use the SageMaker examples. That's the best way. They even include things like the entire course, the fast AI course um, for deep learning. Um, there's the entire course uh, material is in this uh, Jupyter Notebook uh, SageMaker examples. <clears throat> So we look at the SageMaker Notebook, some of the screenshots. So SageMaker Notebook has another flavor, which is um, the Jupyter team is uh, hopefully it, it's moving towards a much more uh, comprehensive interface. Um, it's called Jupyter, uh, Jupyter Lab. Jupyter Lab uh, has a lot, just think about that as uh, Jupyter Notebook has a lot of bells and whistles. So our, uh, we, recently released the SageMaker Studio, which is a much, much more enhanced uh, Jupyter Hub environment. Um, you can consider that to be the integrated development environment for machine learning uh, instead of the IDE or Eclipse. You got probably some of you are use, use, using as the IDE. Uh, use SageMaker Studio as the IDE for machine learning or AWS. Um, in that IDE, you can create different domains. You can diff create different user profiles. And they can, different users, they don't have to spin up their own Jupyter Notebook. They can use the same uh, studio and they share the notebook among themselves and get, get going really quickly. Um, we also introduced, in addition to the enhanced interface, we also introduced some key features um, in the Jupyter uh, in a um, SageMaker Studio. One of them is the experiment. So when you are building a model, you are doing a lot of hyperparameter tuning. Um, it's really hard to keep track of uh, what you did. Uh, unless you have an Excel spreadsheet, then write down the hyperparameters and then the results, right? Um, the metrics you get. Um, that's a lot of work uh, to do that. So we automate this whole process and we created something called SageMaker Experiment. Um, We'll keep track of all the hyperparameters you use and the results, and then we can provide you with charts. Um, and then so you can decide which model is performs uh, much better. And also while you're doing machine learning, uh, things like uh, tracking if your uh, loss function is actually converging. Um, uh, things like those. So without a debugger, it's really difficult. Now we introduce the SHMaker debugger that you can actually look at the intermediate results and things like um, the neurons or within in your hidden layer, how the neurons are behaving or how the loss functions are behaving. Is it converging or not during your training? Um, you you got great in uh, in depth uh, insights into this model. Um, it's not a black box anymore. And then um, after you deploy your data, so let's say your data is trained on um, data you, you collected in the past two years, and then you put your model up um, for inference using your application. And then your application will start having this drift because the data, uh, either the people who are using your application, the demographic has changed, or the environment has changed, right? Or your model might not be accurate anymore. So how do you do, how do you monitor that after your model is deployed? So we create this model monitoring for you to do that. Um, you can keep track of the drift, and then you can decide if you need to get the new data and then retrain that data again. Um, so you can automate the whole process within with a pipeline, and then uh, while still keep your application up and running, so with no interruption to your business or your research. <clears throat> There's another. Um, SageMaker Notebook is called <laughs> very confusing. Sorry, sorry for the, the confusion of the uh, of the naming. Is a capital N SageMaker Notebook is um, is a service that uh, individual users can use that service to share um, their notebooks with it, within each other. You don't have to cut and paste or send the no notebook file itself in an email to your um, collaborators. Uh, you can just share them within this uh, SageMaker Studio environment. All right, so that's a that's a really high level um, introduction to the to the SageMaker on AWS and then some of the underlying services uh, it uses. So how do you get started? Um, open an AWS account if you don't have one. Uh, really simple and straightforward. And then there's a lot of free um, services 
the, the account itself is free. When you open up an account, you don't, um, it, it doesn't cost you anything. And also, when you open up the account, it'll provide you with a lot of free services. There's uh, the first year, a lot of the virtual machines, some of the smaller sized virtual machines are free to you. And also it's in SageMaker, there are lots of hours of notebook. You can you can totally run through a lot of those um, SageMaker example notebooks um, with this free tier. Um, when you register with uh, a new account with AWS, um, remember always use your EDU email. Um, that edu email because um, there are lots of benefits that come with that edu email and then uh, some some promotions that uh, might be easier to get to you. <clears throat> um, there's a way. So I know we went through this really really quickly today. Um, so if you have any questions or if you're interested in learning more about certain service and you have a research or you have a researcher that you need to support do certain things, data analytics, machine learning, or quantum computing, um, go to this uh, URL to contact us. Um, one of our representatives will get in touch with you. So um, just to explain the structure. Um, so if you're affiliated with the higher education institution, you will have a, we call a local account team that includes account manager that can help you to deal with your account issues. And then you'll also have a, a solutions architect like me to provide you with the technical uh, guidance or technical discussions. So the way we provide support is we do a lot of free training um, in forms of immersion days and workshops and also similar uh, webinars like this. Um, so workshop, if you're interested in do a deep dive with some of the services I talked about today and then you can contact us, we'll get you in touch with your account team we can do some deep dive immersion days or workshops or even hands-on workshops to, to get you started. We'd love to hear from you. Um, this is the one way to contact us. And then um, there's also this email. Um, if you have any very specific questions about this particular web, webinar or you wanna say, I'm interested in learning more about certain things or any other topic, make sure you uh, send us an email. Um, and if you have wanted to get in touch with me, send us an email through uh, send us an email to this address as well. Uh, our research team will get in touch with me and with your specific questions. So now let's um, move on to uh, the demo section. So I'll show you what the um, what the AWS environment look like and some of the um, notebooks I talked about. When you first log into AWS, you will get to this uh, AWS Management Console. Uh, we call it the console. So I mentioned that there are over around 300 different services. Uh, you get a list of all the services, um, all different kinds uh, in there. It's, um, it's like a candy shop. Um, the way to get to specific service is to find that from that list or just simply type, uh, let's say I want to do SageMaker, it will show up, right? So this is the interface of the SageMaker. Um, there are ways to get access to the notebook instance. And uh, also I have individual notebooks and or you can just get access to the SageMaker Studio from, from this uh, page. Um, I already have uh, some of the notebook up and running. So here is the example I talked about using or doing hands-on learning using Jupyter Notebook is um, uh, when I learned num uh, number vectorization uh, vectorized uh, decorators. Um, you create a serialized function, you create a vectorized with the target of CPU and uh, with the target of uh, parallel, you create a main program with Python program. Um, so the uh, cell-based um, program is that when I make a change to certain things, I can I just run this particular cell and all the things before that is still valid, still there. Um, so the result you will see immediately from the output of that. Right? So for example, in this case, um, my vectorize with parallel, it took 1.6 seconds instead of uh, the 87 seconds of my serial and then nine seconds with the CPU parallelization. So this is a very simple uh, way to do uh, hands-on learning. I'll show you the EMR, what, what it looked like. So I have a cluster that running, uh, I call my cluster. 
Um, math currently has this one master node and a, a two core node. Um, then I attach uh, then I attach this notebook to that cluster. I'll create a Spark context and then uh, look at the table. There is a table called orders. And there's a table called line items. Uh, here's my query. I want to do uh, some map reduce. Uh, here is the job I run. Um, the result is showing here, and then the monitoring. I can look at the Spark job. I already ran this, so it's uh, <clears throat> there. It, this query is broken down into over 100 different tasks that do uh, that's like distributed into different nodes of on the cluster uh, underneath it. <clears throat> so you can see that um, those nodes are doing their job, and I get the result <clears throat> back. Because I have run this um, a query before, there are certain things that uh, that's cached. That the Spark recognizes it's done. That the, <coughs> excuse me, and it decided to skip. So the results is here, and then if you do a query of the count, I have uh, about 74 million rows in that ta in those tables. So that it takes about. Um, Lapse time. The second query took about seven seconds. The seven. The first query took about um, 400 seconds of that uh, particular uh, select. So that is the EMR notebook. So let's go to the Glue notebook. Uh, Glue is the um, again. The Glue is the a service that we do ETLs. So what do you do in this example? I have a whole bunch of CSV files sitting on my S3 bucket. They include the U.S. Um, all the U.S. legislatures, their names, their uh, their job, um, their uh, history of, or their whatever they did, uh, or their districts, things like those. Those are all. We have um, six different files. <clears throat> One is for person, their names, and their membership, or which party they affiliate with, which subcommittee they're. <clears throat> which organization they belong to, what happens, and which area they represent. I use this uh, Jupyter Notebook to load this files, <clears throat> load those files, and I create uh, from the CSV file, and I create them, put them into a, load them into a dynamic frame. Um, the data frame is really similar to a pandas data frame, but it's specific to Glue. Once I load those different entities, uh, persons, uh, memberships, I, uh, I can do some joins. I can do some filtering. Uh, those are the transformation phase. That's the T in the ETL, right? <clears throat> As I do that, I can even create relationships. Remember, those files are all discrete files that has certain keys that can be linked to each other. I can use those keys uh, to join most uh, different data, different CSV files, and turn them into a relational uh, data set. And then I can just save them into a relation, write them into a relational database. So this is the E, extract, T, transform, and load, load into the database. So you can do all this. Once you're done with it, I, let's say if I need to do all this over and over again, I can put them in, create a job, and then create them a workflow to, do, to automate the entire process. Um, now let's go look at the um, the quantum computing environment. So it's also a Jupyter notebook. Notebook is, looks uh, very similar. It comes with um, certain examples as well. So we don't want you to start learning um, by yourself. So we have those Jupyter notebooks already created as examples in there. Uh, you can start uh, looking at or even learning what uh, quantum annihilator is. Um, <clears throat> execute through each steps. Take a device. You uh, right now use a local simulator <clears throat> and run this algorithm you just created, and then train the model. So if you have a lot of explanation to, to do with your algorithm, you can put. <clears throat> right there in the notebook and share with other people. Right. So those are, you can even use some creative uh, ASCII artwork uh, to print out the results so people can have a visualization. 
or you can use more fancy Matplot uh, library to create a much better uh, looking chart. And then uh, once that's done, you can, uh, you can run it on a simulator. And then once that's done, you can switch to a real quantum device. That, uh, that's, yeah, <clears throat> that's the quantum, uh, that's a gate-based quantum computer example. Uh, here is another one that's um, a quantum annihilator-based example as well. So uh, let's take a look at the where you find this uh, SageMaker example. The, the, the best place to learn quantum, <laughs> the, the uh, machine learning is, is here. Once you start a SageMaker uh, notebook, you will get this interface. It has the file and then has the SageMaker examples. This is the where, uh, where all the, the good stuff is. So if you look at that, each one of those lines is a category that has tons of um, example Jupyter notebooks in there. Um, this is a collection of our um, building SageMaker algorithms. And then you can uh, learn fast AI course, or you can do, um, you can learn what the SageMaker example, there's an example for that. Uh, or if you want to see how R is uh, running on in this uh, SageMaker notebook, you can do that as well. <clears throat> So I, yeah, I don't have time to go through each one of those. I just uh, quickly uh, show you the, what this machine learning notebook uh, look like. And don't, don't be afraid, they're they're pretty straightforward, especially when you have uh, those examples to start with. This is one of the example we do uh, the time series uh, analytics. So the reason I show you this is uh, there are a lot of uh, charts and diagrams in here that you can um, it can facilitate those uh, data analytics before you actually build your model. So for, for this particular model, we're looking at hundreds of uh, different companies, the uh, utility usage. We're trying to predict what's gonna happen in the next two, uh, next week or next month. Uh, one thing I wanna emphasize is that, uh, so there's a model being trained, um, not being trained, it's already trained. But, um, one thing I wanna show you is the capability of using something called widgets. So in your web application, you will provide uh, forms and input fields for people to in, uh, input the parameters and stuff, right? So in here, in SageMaker, you can actually build those widgets. For example, I can change the number, uh, the, the customer number. I want to look at another number. I can actually change that and then run the interact, I click on the interact button, I get this data immediately. So it's really similar to a web application or live Web application, web application. You can do all this in Jupyter Notebook on, in SageMaker Jupyter Notebook very easily through widgets too. Um, I okay. I have one minute. I'll leave. Yeah. So I'll just show you the uh, the uh, SageMaker Studio. So we have something really cool. You guys, I hope you guys all play with that. It's called Autopilot. Um, you start with a CSV file. You hand it to SageMaker. Uh, you just SageMaker, uh, build a model for me and then take a look at all these features, see what features are good for me. So you can um, just give us the CSV files, the SageMaker autopilot will take that and then analyze the do feature engineering and get rid of some certain files, do some dimensionality reduction, uh, uh, reduce the number of parameters and then build a model, uh, run hundreds of different experiments on with the different hyperparameters. At the end, it will give you a list of all the models we built, and it will tell you that this particular model is the best because it gives you the highest F1 score. Okay, so that's perfect for people who are not really familiar with models, and then they will, they have a simple two-dimensional data set they want uh, to build a model on. So this is one of the examples uh, what the SageMaker Studio can do. Um, the Possibility of limiters. Um, one of the examples, uh, one of the projects I'm working on is I'm trying to build a Jupyter notebook to front uh, a parallel cluster, uh, HPC cluster that to do, um, to do data processing or uh, do simulation. So that's it for my for the demo and my session. So I have four minutes for questions. Thank you, Jinjin. That was such a great presentation. Um, we do have a lot of questions, so I'm going to dive right in. The first one is, can you give an example of using Jupyter Notebook in a coding environment that is integrated with GitHub? Oh, so yeah, really uh, easy, uh, actually. So 
if you can, you of course, uh, even if it's serverless, you can get access to uh, the underlying uh, terminal. And then in that terminal, then you can just use Git. So um, I might not have a Git installed, but uh, you can install a Git here and then you can integrate your GitHub repository there and pull your pull your all your notebooks and save it there or pull it uh, from the github and the jupyter actually um, the jupyter studio the sagemaker studio is fully integrated with uh with the github so here's the left hand side i already have a github repository uh, tied to this uh, particular environment so i can see all um, my project uh, which is an amazon sagemaker examples you know Perfect. Okay, next question. Can you code using GPUs in a serverless environment? Yes. So what we uh, what we look at is the the way you do um, deep learning is that when you build a model, you create a container. So when this container is being run, uh, let me see if I can find that piece of code, uh, build a model. When you get the container, you build the model, you will specify <clears throat> the instance type you're running on. Uh, for example, in this case, let's do files, train a model. Yeah, so in this case, I'm going to train, I'm going to run this model in a, on an instance called mlc 4 x 2x large. That's our compute. Uh, that doesn't have a GPU. But if you change this instance to a compute, uh, to a GPU based, a P instance or a G instance, then you can take advantage of the NVIDIA uh, GPUs on on a, um, in that environment. So we have a uh, P instance that contains um, like eight uh, T100 GPUs have uh, up to 300 gig gigabytes of uh, video memory along on that particular instance. So you can totally get access to the GPU instance to train your model in a serverless okay. environment. Great. I'm just going to grab one more since we're almost out of time. Can you describe how we can cost model using EMR notebook? Um, and he said, i.e., understand the cost before we commit to using an ENR, e EMR notebook. Yeah, so th uh, that uh, I like to recommend you to get in touch with your account team. Um, so the, uh, of course, you when you're building that, you use a smaller instance, and uh, uh, that all the instance uh, pricing are re are public. You can find out, right? But uh, definitely do some benchmarking with a smaller uh, cluster. Let's say uh, run error process with a smaller data uh, data set, uh, one tenth of the size you want to process, for example. Right? Run it on a two node cluster, and then if, uh, you get a good idea of how long it's going to run. Uh, once it runs, and then you can uh, linearly scale. Those clusters scale really, really well, if, unless you have extremely large data sets, but normally they scale really well linearly. And you can have a good idea of modify by 10. Right? That's how much you're going to need. So let's say your uh, development environment runs um, X large, and then you want to run on um, 18X large, then you, you can compare the uh, factors in there, and you have a very good understanding of how much. Uh, it's pretty finite. Um, it's all under your control. So definitely get uh, in touch with your account team, your account uh, managers, and a solutions architect can help you benchmark and estimate. Um, they might even be able to get you some credit for proof of concept, so you don't have to spend any money to do the benchmarking. Wonderful. Thank you again, Jinjun. Jin. And um, for the audience, I know there were a lot of questions that we didn't get to, so I placed um, a couple links in the chat. One is to our homepage for the research seminar series, community series, um, and one is for uh, the alias you can reach out to with additional questions, and we'll be happy to, to make sure that those go to the right people inside AWS. That's AWS slash, or I'm sorry, dash WWPS dash seminar at Amazon.com. Uh, on the screen. Yes, exactly. And I wanted to let everybody know our next community session for the AWS Education Research Seminar Series will be about cloud computing for the era of brain observatories with Dr. Ariel Rocum, Research Assistant Professor at the University of Washington Department of Psychology. 
That session will be on Wednesday, September 30th at 9 o'clock a.m. Pacific Standard Time, and a registration link will soon be available on that series um, homepage that I put in the chat, so please be sure to register. Um, and thank you so much for the time today. We look forward to hearing from you and seeing you again in our future sessions, and have a great day. Thank you.